Okay, I think that um, it's incredibly important to be clear about what we mean by imperialism. Um, of course, uh, we're just coming to the 100th anniversary of the outbreak of the First World War on the 4th of August 1914. Um, in order to understand the meaning of that event, um, we have to set it in the context of the imperialist system as it prevailed at that time. But it's, it's really, really important to understand that being clear about imperialism isn't to do with history. Of course, it's important to understand history, and having a historical perspective on the present makes us understand the present b better, but we need to have clarity about imperialism because of the political situation that we um, face at the present time. Now, the, the kind of common sense meaning of imperialism is really a powerful state dominating other weaker countries. You know, we think about the Roman Empire or the Persian Empire or the Ottoman Empire. Um, the domination of a great power um, imposing its will through military force, through financial power, all sorts of other ways, that's, that's the dominant uh, picture that, that emerges. Now, if we look at the contemporary world and we look for a candidate for uh, a state that plays that kind of role, that fulfills that kind of understanding of imperialism, it's very obviously the United States. The United States um, is the biggest military power in the world. It's still the biggest economy in the world. It's a, at the center of the global financial system. It also orchestrates a very uh, complex network of global alliances. If you look at the major international institutions like the United Nations and the International Monetary Fund, the U.S. is the, the dominant state in, in that. Uh, the U.S. asserts the right to um, pursue uh, what it regards as enemies anywhere in the world. And that can take the form, of course, we know the form, um, the most visible form that takes is drone uh, killings in all sorts of parts of the world, but it takes other forms as well. There's a big French bank, um, I've forgotten its name for the minute, um, which is being fi of, uh, fined uh, a very large amount of money, billions of dollars, and is having its license to practice in the United States uh, suspe suspended uh, for, for a year because it broke U.S. legislation about sanctions against Iran not in the United States, but just uh, in terms of its global activities. So the U.S. claims the right to exercise power, not just within the borders of the American state worldwide. So that looks like you know, a pretty good uh, example of um, an imperial power in the traditional sense. And it's important to recognize that and to hang on to that sort of old core meaning of the word imperialism. But if we sing, simply equate imperialism or empire with the power of the United States, then we get things very badly wrong. And what I'm going to try and bring out is the way in which sections of the left have got the situation in different countries, most importantly Syria and Ukraine, very badly wrong because they've just operated on the criterion that imperialism is reducible to the United States in its global role and um, th that, therefore, there are no other manifestations of imperialism, no other imperialist powers in the, in the world. This has led free, so to sections of the left um, really um, refusing to recognise and acknowledge the kind of imperial role that Russia plays in its so-called near abroad and that it's asserting very strongly in Ukraine at the present time. So what I want to do is to talk about imperialism not in this broad, if you like, trans-historical sense, imperialism through the ages, although, as I've said, it's important to hang on to that particular meaning and not to lose sight of it. I want to talk about imperialism in the Marxist sense. Um, so what is imperialism from a Marxist perspective? Well, the most famous uh, Marxist definition of imperialism is by Lenin in the little pamphlet that's on the, on the table there. 
uh, which is called imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism. Now, actually, the original Russian version is imperialism, the latest stage of capitalism, and that, there's quite a lot important difference there, because if you talk about imperialism as the final stage of capitalism, it me- the implication is now we've got imperialism, capitalism's gone, you know, we can forget about it, but unfortunately, here we are, 100 years after the period in which Lenin wrote that pamphlet, and uh, capitalism is still with us. But nevertheless, what's crucial to Lenin's conception of imperialism is an an understanding of imperialism as a specific phase of capitalist development. What Lenin is saying is what we popularly call um, imperialism, and there are two elements to that. There's the element that I've just referred to, which is the dominant of a big power over other countries, but there's also a second element which is crucial and which is one of the things that gets lost sight of in in a lot of contemporary left discussion. There's the clash of rival empires. You know, the Roman Empire dominated the Mediterranean world. It was the great empire um, in uh, what became the modern Europe and the the Middle East, but it wasn't on its own. It had a major rival further to its east, first the Parthian Empire and then the Persian Empire. So you have the clash of rival empires. So what Lenin is saying is in the modern world, these crucial features of imperialism have to be understood in the context of the development and transformation of capitalism. Um, Now, I... the. So what what is this transformation? The way that I would prefer to put it, and it's something I develop in my book, Imperialism and Global Political Economy, very much in parallel with David Harvey. David Harvey in his book, The New Imperialism, which was published just over 10 years ago, just before the outbreak of the Iraq War, has a very similar conception of imperialism. The way... The way we both understand imperialism, I'll put it in my own, I'll use my own formulations, is that modern capitalist imperialism represents the intersection of economic and geopolitical competition. What does that mean? Economic competition is one of the fundamental features of capitalism. Marx says capitalism is defined by two fundamental characteristics. First of all, and more fundamentally, the exploitation of wage labour by capital. This is the fundamental class antagonism that defines capitalism. But secondly, there's a second crucial antagonism, which is that internal to the capitalist class. The capitalist class, Marx says, aren't a sort of unified block. They're a band of hostile brothers. They fight with each other over the spoils of their exploitation. And the form this fight takes is is economic competition, the economic rivalry by different capitalist firms for markets, for sites of investment, for labour power, raw materials, etc., etc., etc. It's the interaction between these two antagonisms, the antagonism between capital and wage labour and the antagonism among capitals, what Marx calls many capitals, that drives capitalism as a system. So that's economic competition, What is geopolitical competition? Geopolitical competition is essentially the rivalries between different states, states trying to assert their power against other states, trying to get um, more territory, more wealth, uh, sometimes going to war with each other, often short of war, um, uh, having arms races against each other, building up their military power against each other. That's geopolitical competition. Now, geopolitical competition has been going on for a long time. I talked about the, the, the rivalry between the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire in the early, um, uh, the, 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 uh, early um, centuries of the, um, of the modern, modern era. But, um, and the, there's a classic book by the great Greek histo- ancient Greek historian Thucydides about the Peloponnesian War, the long struggle between the two great Greek city-states of Athens and Sparta. That's another example of geopolitical competition. But something changes, essentially, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and this is what leads to the emergence of modern imperialism. What changes? Capit- as a result of the competitive dynamic of capitalism, 
Marx argues you have what he calls the concentration and centralization of capital. In other words, uh, over time, the units, the basic units of the system, the individual firms, the individual capitals, grow in size. They become bigger and bigger. And also, if you look at individual sectors, the population of those capitals shrinks. In other words, capitals don't just get bigger, but you have sectors dominated by smaller and smaller numbers of, of capitals. And as part of that process of the concentration and centralization of capital, increasingly the competitive, the economic competitive struggle among, among capitals um, takes a global st st stage. The, the struggle for trade and sites of investment takes place on a, on a global basis. This is already happening in the late 19th century. There's a huge flow of foreign investment to the, to the rest, from Europe to the rest of the world. There's a great study of this um, by an American economic historian, Herbert, I think Herbert Feist, called Europe the world's banker. And he describes how the, the, the export of capital from Europe fueled the unification of the world economy in the late 19th century, and, but gave rise to economic and territorial rivalries that laid the basis for the outbreak of the First, the first, first World War. So the concentration of centralization of capital leads to capitals competing, competing on a world scale. Increasingly, capitals, to pursue their economic rivalries, need the support of their individual state. So states get drawn into the economic competition among capitals. Equally, states come more and more to, to depend upon the capitalism that exists within their territory. Even if you're the Russian Tsar or the Austro-Hungarian Emperor or the German Kaiser, you need to have a developed capital industrial base to have the weapon systems, the transport um, systems like the railways and so on, to the the um, the the the, um, the ability to produce and distribute food uh, to your armies, all of which um, all of which depend upon having an industrial capitalist uh, system. So there's growing interdependence between the state and capital, which means leads to this intersection, sometimes fusion, between economic and geopolitical competition, and it's that fusion that then produces. The, the horrors of the first half of the 20th century. In particular, Britain, as the dominant imperialist power, the beginning of the 20th century, Britain is the key force in the spread of investment to the rest of the world. Britain is the major colonial power. Britain orchestrates the global financial markets, etc., etc. But increasingly, it's confronted by challenges, in particular by two challenges, Germany and the United States, both of which overtake Britain in industrial terms by the beginning of the 20th century. They're producing more manufacturing goods, but also they start building world-class navies. And it was Britain's naval power that was critical to knitting together um, the dominance of British capital, capital globally. The Royal Navy was Britain's great military, military enforcer. So British imperialism is faced with an increasingly mortal threat, and it's this that is the ultimate source of the two great imperialist wars of the first half of the 20th century. One th very important thing that, that follows from that is that imperialism isn't reducible to the dominance of one power. Imperialism is a system, yes, of domin global domination, but global domination that takes the form, crucially, of com competition and rivalry among the leading, ca leading capitalist powers. And Lenin is extremely clear about this. It's, uh, sometimes re Lenin's imperialism is read through the lens of the kind of third-worldist critique of capitalism that was very influential um, in the 1950s, 60s, and, and 70s, as if, as if Lenin is just talking about the way in which the rich Western countries dominate the rest of the world. Of course, that's there in Lenin, but that's not the focus of his analysis. He's, you know, he's writing this pamphlet after the outbreak of the First World War. He, above all, wants to explain why the world has, has descended into this bloody turmoil, so he's critically concerned with explaining the underlying structure that leads to this competitive struggle. And there's one very important idea. I mean, some of Lenin's analysis 
to be honest, wasn't really quite right even at the time. Other bits have become outdated since then. But there's a crucial idea that is of very great relevance today. This is the idea of uneven development. In other words, capitalism develops the productive forces, the productive powers of humankind um, on a world, world scale, but it doesn't do that in a homogenous way. There's always uneven development between different parts of the world. Imperialism, in the sense of the rich countries dominating the poor countries, is an expression of that process of uneven development. But critically, there's uneven development among the different leading capitalist states that has a constant destabilizing effect. There's a brilliant passage where Lenin is dealing with the idea put forward by the German Marxist, actually he may have been Czech, but anyway, he was the dominant Marxist in Germany, Karl Kautsky. Um, he put for, uh, Kautsky put forward the idea that, um, that, uh, of ultra-imperialism. In other words, the concentration and centralization of capital that I was talking about would reach its limit with the kind of global integration of capital. And once capital is gl integrated globally on an economic basis, that will lead to an end of geopolitical rivalries and war. There's a contemporary version of that put forward by Michael Hart and Tony Negri in their book, book Empire. And, and Lenin says this can't happen. This can't happen because of e uneven development. Because uneven development means that the economic and therefore the power relations between the leading capitalist states is changing all the time. He says, look at Germany. 50 years ago, Germany was a miserable backward country. Um, now, it's challenging Britain for global dominance. Why is that? Because of the process of uneven development. This is an idea that Trotsky develops further. Uneven and combined development, Trotsky puts it. It's not just that some countries are more advanced than other countries, but that sometimes backward countries can leap ahead of the more advanced countries by moving from a state of economic backwardness to adopting the latest technologies and economic institutions and so, so on and so forth. And Lenin, Lenin's, what Lenin's saying is that this process of uneven, and to include Trotsky as well, combined development, is constantly going to be destabilizing the power relations between the major capitalist states. And that means that any kind of political deal... Um, but among the leading capitalist states, on the basis of their current economic relations, will be destabilized by the further process of uneven and combined, combined, combined development. And this is very important in understanding the world today. I mean, I, Lenin talks about Germany versus, um, versus Britain. Today, we'd say China versus the United States. And that's something I want to come on to say uh, more about. So imperialism in this sense... Uh, is, um, is systemic. It's not reducible to the domination of any one power, including that of the United States today. Why is it so hard for us to see that today? I think they're because of two opti optical illusions. One is the optical illusion created by the USSR. In other words, for uh, nearly half a century... After 1945, the dominant geopolitical rivalry is between the Western bloc, led, it, led by the US, and the Soviet bloc, headed by the USSR. Much of the left saw the USSR as a socialist country or a workers' state or something like that. In other words, a society that had broken with capitalism. Um, and that meant that they couldn't see the dynamic of the struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union as a form of inter-imperialist rivalry. That was a mistake. Uh, we in the Socialist Workers' Party have always argued that what existed in the USSR was not socialism or whatever. It was a particular form of capitalism, state capitalism. And therefore, we argued that the, that the Cold War had to be seen as a particular form of inter-imperialist rivalries. But if you thought of the Soviet Union as... Um, if you like, a post-capitalist society. It couldn't be inter-imperialist rivalry. And indeed, the Soviet Union, in some sense, represented the interests of the forces of progress on a global scale. And this was argued by some very sophisticated people, like Trotsky's biographer, the, uh, Isaac, Isaac Deutscher. That idea of that view of global politics still survives the, to, today in the idea that the Russian state the inheritor geopolitically of the Soviet Union 
still plays a residual anti-imperialist role. So this is one optical illusion that the left suffer, suffers from. The second uh, optical illusion comes from after the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. This is what one American neocon calls the unipolar moment. In other words, there's this period after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War where the US seems to be overwhelmingly the dominant, dominant global power. There seems to be no rival to the United States. This, some people said this isn't empire in the Negri sense, where no one is dominant anymore. This is U.S. super-imperialism. The U.S. overwhelmingly dominates everywhere in the, in the world, and therefore imperialism effectively is equated to the uh, U.S. for that reason. Now, this, this analysis was always a mistake. It was always a mistake because the... What you see from over a long period is the relative economic decline of the United States compared, forget about the Soviet Union or whatever, compared to the other leading capitalist states. Um, it, was, it slowed down in the 1980s and 1990s, but it, it was a long-term process. And what, what the unipolar moment, therefore, was contradictory. U.S. relative economic decline was continuing, but the U.S. had overwhelming milit military superiority over the other powers. In interestingly, the neocons, the advisors to the Bush administration, understood this very clearly. They knew that in the long term, the U.S. was facing challenges from the rising powers, particularly in Asia, and they identified China as the threat relatively early on. What they wanted to do, what, what was behind the project for New American Century, was using America's overwhelming military superiority to entrench American domination of the Middle East by, by seizing whole of uh, Iran and its, its oil. So they, want, they understood the contradiction, but they wanted to use their major asset of American military power to perpetuate U.S. US dominance. Now, now, of course, that failed completely. And it, in fact, rebounded on them in ways that, um, I want to, I want, uh, that are very visible at the present, present, present time. And everyone now, particularly since the economic crisis started in 2007, 2008, now recognizes U.S. economic decline. And it, to some extent, they, arguably, they exaggerate it. But the reality is American hegemony is increasingly contested. This is, of course very evident in the, in the Middle East, where the U.S. has been weakened, firstly, by the failure of the adventure, military adventure in Iraq. Do I need to argue with anyone that they failed in Iraq? Is there anyone who still harbors the illusion that, you know, somehow the U.S. won because Blackwater or, or corporations like that made a bit of money out of the whole thing? You know, the loss of Mosul is just a, you know, minor thing and so on. The U.S. defeat in Iraq, but then, of course, the hammer blow of the Arab revolutions and the way in which they've destabilized the whole region and weakened and put on the defensive all, all the, re the, the regimes. The advance of ISIS very much reflects these processes. It reflects, on the one hand, the way in which the U.S. could only stabilize Iraq on a highly sectarian basis, which created the conditions for new risings, and uh, ISIS is has put it at the, at the head of the, the latest rising, but also of the way in which the, um, the Arab revolutions produced this, this, uh, the, the, the war in, in Syria, which gave ISIS a, a very important op opening that they've seized, seized on. So the Middle East is one clear evidence of the decline of American power. Much more importantly, from a long point of view, is what's happening in, uh, in Asia. Because China has now... China represents the biggest threat that American hegemony has ever faced, really. A bigger threat than the Soviet Union, which was militarily very powerful, but was always much, much weaker than the United States. China is now the biggest industrial and trading economy in the world. And this is producing, not necessarily through, doesn't have to be through a conscious effort on the part of the Chinese leaders, a rejigging of global economic and therefore political relationships as large parts of Africa and Latin America reorient as supplies of raw materials to China and as, as China lends money 
very generously across large portions of the global south and sends out its companies to build infrastructure and so on to facilitate the extraction of raw materials from these, these countries, there is an in inevitable shift in um, the orientation of states. States don't necessarily look to Washington for solutions any, anymore, particularly since Washington is paralyzed because of the fighting between Obama and the Tea Party and so, so on and so forth. Increasingly, they look towards Beijing. But secondly, in a more direct geopolitical sense, China's very high growth rate, it's slowing down, but it's still pretty high, 7% or something like that, is allowing China to increase military spending very, very rapidly. Um, China's military spending has been in double digits for a very long time. Chi Chinese, milita Chinese military forces are much weaker than those of the United States even now, but the U.S. is actually cutting back on military spending, reducing the size of its army, reducing the number of ships it has, and, and, and so on and so forth. And that means that the gap between the U.S. and China militarily is shrinking all the time. Particularly, what China is doing is trying to build a world-class navy. Sound familiar? This is what the U.S. and Germany did before the First, Wor First World War with specific objectives. The US, has, the U.S. Navy has dominated the Pacific since the Second World War. For some strange re reason, the Chinese don't think that that's obviously the natural state of things. More importantly, China is incredibly dependent economically on the flow of raw materials and goods uh, through the seas around its coast via the Straits of Malacca, which are the is the narrow, uh, the, the, the juncture point between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. The Straits of Malacca, the way in which China's oil exports get to China and the way in which China's exports of manufactured goods reach large parts of the rest, the rest of the world. The Chinese ruling class think they need a navy that can protect those interests and they're developing the capability to push the U.S. Navy, at least out of the seas, close to China itself. China is also assert, has started asserting itself very strongly in a whole series of territorial disputes in both the South China Sea, which is strategically the more important, but also there's a dispute in the East China Sea between Ch China and Japan over a group of, group of island, islands there. Now, this doesn't... I should just say, you know... You can tell this story in a way that scares the living daylights out of us all. And the Japanese Prime Minister said recently that Asia is beginning look, to look like Europe before 1914. Now, this guy, Abe, you know, isn't just saying that as a disinterested observer. He's a, Chinese, sorry, a Japanese ultra-nationalist who is building up, trying to build up support for a much more aggressive foreign policy on the part of Japan, in particular asserting the interests of the Japanese state and Japanese imperialism against, against China. So you shouldn't just take, it, take his word for it. There's no reason for what's happened, um, what happened in Europe leading up to 1914 to happen um, in, East, in East Asia today or in five or 10 or 15 years ago. But nevertheless, there is a dynamic of geopolitical conflict. And it's very, very interesting this is the focus of globalization. Where has globalization... There's a lot of bullshit talked about globalization. But where has globalization in the sense of the expansion of global investment and trade changed the world economy? In East Asia. And at the same time, East Asia is a cockpit of geopolitical rivalries. It's not just China who's building up its military power. So is Japan, so is South Korea, so is uh, the Philippines... Vietnam are rethinking their standoff relationship to the United States because they have a common um, interest in, a, in a blocking China and so, so on and so forth. The other, the other thing to say is that China's rise then emboldens other powers. Why is Putin pushing so hard? Not just, not just over Ukraine, but also over Syria. Partly, he wants to defend his particular imperialist patch against the... Um, against, very obviously, against the kind of self-assertion of, in a very inept way, by the EU and behind it the US in Ukraine, but also 
Putin feels more confident about asserting himself because of the relative weakening of the United States and the greater, the greater strength of China. So we're moving into a situation of growing inter-imperialist rivalries. And therefore, if you don't understand the systemic character of imperialism, imperialism as this system of competition, not just the domination of, of, of one power, then you are completely disoriented. You are unable to understand the world in which we're living in uh, politically at the present time. And this leads to, um, uh, and we, we can see this lack of understanding in the development of, of campism. Campism is a form of left politics that developed during the Cold War, which said, you know, the, the US is the great global center of reaction, um, but there are progressive states that, can, um, that represent the, the global forces of, of resistance to imperialism, headed by the Soviet Union, but identifying also various allies of the Soviet Union, particularly in different parts of the, the, the glo global south. Today, campism embraces Russia, I don't know, Venezuela, Iran, a number of states around the world who's, who have foreign policy conflicts with the, with, the, with the United States. This leads, if you take this line, you are led into terrible, terrible political errors. You are led to apologizing for Russian imperialism in Ukraine. Sure, you know, I mean, Lenin in his writings on the First World War says it's silly to approach inter-imperialist conflict like it's a kid's game and, you know, someone is in the wrong because they started it. In a sense, the EU started it <coughs> by pulling hard to get Ukraine within their, within their sphere of influence. But Russia has kicked back actually very effectively in a way that um, is, you know, could produce the combined effects of the pressure of the different external powers could create a tragedy. It could lead to a reproduction of the kind of ethnic civil wars that we saw in the Balkans in the, in the, in the 1990s. If those happen, I hope very much they don't, if those happen, if there's ethnic civil war in Ukraine, that will be a responsibility of both the imperialist actors in the situ situation. The other um, terrible mistake that people have made on the basis of a campus view of the world is to support the Assad regime in Syria against the revolutionary forces in Syria. And behind that has been the illusion that there's a kind of block of progressive states in the world. But if you think that kind of thing, then the world is incomprehensible at the minute. Because, you know, what did Assad do? You know, there's ISIS on the march, uh, humiliating the US and threatening the overthrow of the Maliki regime. How did ISIS get where it did? Part, through a tacit, partly through a tacit alliance with Assad. Assad's forces and ISIS didn't fight each other in Syria. There are stories that ISIS, because it controls the, the oil fields in the east of Syria, have been selling oil to Assad and in exchange getting power for the towns and, and the other areas that they, that they control. Uh, so Assad helps to build, build up ISIS in order to weaken the forces against him. Now ISIS are on the march. They're threatening the Maliki government in Iraq, which is very closely allied to Iran. So Assad has changed his line, and he started bombing um, the, uh, the, the ISIS for forces. The new coalition of the willing that is resisting the march of Islamist terrorism in, uh, um, in Iraq is the United States, Iran, and Syria. You know, the United States in alliance with sections of the axis of evil. How do you, if you think, you know, obviously if you think there's an axis of evil, you know, if you're, you know, if you believe all the nonsense that people like Blair say, then you're totally confused. You're completely muddled. But also if you think that, you know, Iran and Syria under Assad are sort of, you know, reliable anti-imperialist states, you also get tr tr tremendously confused. You, we have to understand that the logic of competition that imperialism generates on a global scale penetrates down to every region of the world and that within regions like, um, like the Middle East, you have sub-imperialist or would-be sub-imperialist powers who are trying to play a role on a regional scale. In, in the, and in the case of the Middle East, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, 
have all had ambitions of that, of that nature. So we should not attach ourselves to loyalty to particular powers as the embodiment of the anti-imperialist struggle. We have to have a position of principled opposition to imperialism, practical opposition to particular imperialist initiatives, whether it's the invasion of Iraq or the expansion of NATO, very often unilateral imperialist initiatives, though the ones I've mentioned are examples of that, but sometimes you have imperialist initiatives from different sides in the same place, which is what's happening in Ukraine. We have to stand against those as, as well. We have to be in solidarity with those who are fighting particular imperialist powers or the effects of imperialism. We have to identify with the struggle of oppressed nationalities, very obvious in the case of the Palestinians at the, at the present time. But that solidarity, while it's important and principled, it's, it's not an end in itself. It's part of the process of building up the forces that cannot simply fight this imperialism here and now, but can get rid of the entire system. Yeah. Uh, I read uh, many years ago a big fat book on IBM during the Second World War and its role in the Holocaust. Yeah? So the whole German railway system was dependent on this IBM computer technology to actually organize the, the railway system to make it possible to kill six million Jews. And, and, it, and the profits out of all this still went to America. So on the one hand, you had this imperialist America where these big blocks like Bukharin and Lenin describe. But it's also underneath it. You also have certain uh, things which sort of contradict it to a certain extent. Or you have Ford Motor Company, which is producing arms for the German military, but at the same time still belongs to Ford. So you have... It's a very strange thing, and this, I think, it also explains how easily imperialist uh, constellations can change. I mean, you have enormous wars, and they're fighting to the teeth, killing millions of people. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, you have a, a, a new constellation. A uh, few, uh, few months ago on uh, Market Street, that's the main area in Manchester, uh, where we do our stalls and uh, anti-bedroom tax campaigning and so on. Uh, I noticed there was a few people giving out a leaflet, uh, hands off Syria. So uh, I sidled over and, and, and got one. I was quite pleased. I think it was a Stop the War Coalition uh, leaflet. Um, but unfortunately, as I read through it, I began to feel very queasy. As you went through one paragraph after the other, it more and more seemed to eulogize Bashar Assad, uh, here is a great man who has spoken out for the Palestinians. Uh, this is why we must side with him against uh, Western imperialism. You know, I just, I, I just felt quite, uh, quite poorly. Uh, I, I went after, went, went over to talk to the uh, the man giving, who gave me the leave. I didn't know him, um, but it just got worse, really. I mean, the more I sort of suggested that maybe this was not the way forward for the Stop the War Coalition, that great movement that put two million on the streets on the 15th of February that we all work so hard to build, uh, that socialists should still participate in, even if it's not on the same scale. But uh, uh, the more he seemed convinced and uh, waved his hand around animatedly that uh, Assad was, um, was a great person who we must, uh, who, 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 who we must support, uh, a big mistake and, and a very sad thing to um, experience uh, given what that movement achieved in, in uniting so many people in Britain um, uh, against, uh, against the, war in Iraq, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, another example, um, maybe, maybe less, less prominent in our movement, in the working class movement in general, but uh, in, the case of, in the case of Ukraine, we have two bunches of gangsters, really. Uh, one cleaves towards uh, Russia as a way to enrich themselves, as they have done from past privatizations uh, around Yanukovych and so on. At the moment, they've uh, lost out, shall we say, to the other gang uh, around uh, Yatsenyuk and uh, Poroshenko, the uh, chocolate millionaire, um, and they see the best way to enrich their faction as through uh, further deals uh, with the, with the, United, uh, with the uh, European Union, backed up by the US. 
But on the, on, as, as, as a group that stand against this, oh, sorry, that, uh, that other group of gangsters have allowed uh, fascists to break through into their government and having sent the police against the fascists in the early stage, now make the leader of one of the fascist groups the interior minister, I think. You know, so this is a horrible bunch. On the other hand, there is a bunch of people who uh, walk around with uh, Russian flags, mainly in the east of the country, they, according to one calculation, they poll the support of around 27% of, uh, not a majority, but 27%. That, that stands to reason, that kind of stacks up roughly with the ethnicity uh, of the region in whole. Uh, a minority, but a substantial minority. Um, a very unpleasant bunch. Can you please sum up? Yeah. And somehow they have got hold of vast amounts of armaments, mysteriously. Are these the alternative to the European Union and to uh, US-backed yeah, uh, imperialism in Ukraine, we have to say no. In the two cases, we have to hope for a revival of a genuine revolutionary movement inside Syria and a working class movement in Ukraine that can bring forward independent demands for, that will further uh, a, a, a workers' movement in the, east of, uh, in the east of Europe and not one of the two uh, big imperialist camps. Charlie will be. I wanted to um, follow on a couple of points about um, China from. That, in particular what Alex was talking about, the confrontation in the East and South China Sea, and to say that in particular you cannot understand what is happening in the South China Sea by blaming American imperialism. It is pri- the, the primary drive, the primary for aggression is actually, coming, is, is actually coming from China, and it is the reason why a number of the China's literal neighbours are now turning to, back, turning to America as a... Um, as, a, as, a, as a force which can defend them against China. If you're, if you're of my generation, it is deeply, deeply tragic to see American warships being welcomed back into Cameron Bay, their base during the Vietnam War, where they were chased out in 1974, being welcomed back by, the, by, you know, by, 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 her, by Ho Chi Minh's descendants. But the reality is that, I mean, there's an interesting quote from a few, a few uh, weeks ago from a Chinese admiral who was saying that, who was talking about pushing back the American expansion and saying that America had to understand that the Pacific was big enough for the both of them. Now, I think if you're the government of the Philippines, if you're the government of Indonesia, if you're the government of any of the other countries bordering the Pacific, you're not going to be especially pleased by that. And the reality is that the Obama administration has, for the first time in two decades, worked out something approximating to an intelligent response to the rise of China through the combination of the military pivot to Asia and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And America is consciously promoting itself to the South- Southeast Asian countries as we are the weaker force, we can, help, we, we can, we can give you support against the, gro- against the, gro- against the growth of big, e- big evil China, and this is getting a degree of traction. Now... There are real problems with them getting away with this. One is on the military, on the military side. Actually, it, you know, as Alex said, it's far more difficult for them, to, for, them to, for them to remove themselves from the Middle East. But they also have a major, fairly major problem with Taiwan because historically Taiwan has always been the country in Southeast Asia that, that uh, China, the, sorry, that America most looked to for support. And when it comes to disputes in East China Sea, South China Sea, Taiwan is absolutely in agreement with China about, the, what, what, about what China's rights are about and, and, about, and about their rights over the, other, over the other governments. So to the extent that America tries to get involved with the other governments in Southeast Asia, they risk, they risk, they, they risk, they risk a, rup, a rupture with Taiwan. Nevertheless, it does remain a very, diff, a, a very deep and very troubling. And the problem, again, is that when Alex talks about campism, it, this applies equally, I think, to China, that there is a campus view of China as somehow a better place than um, a better place, a more advanced society. Please sum up. Oh, surely. Okay, final, final, final census. And this is something, you, this is something that you, you very much see when it, comes to, when it comes to China's colonialism in Tibet and in, and in Xinjiang, with people who you would absolutely expect to know better on any other colonial situation, look at that and think, actually, we're, we're, we support for China. When we, talk about, when we talk about multiple imperialisms, we have to remember that for much of Southeast Asia, Chi- Chinese imperialism is actually a growing and serious threat. After Anna, um, it will be Abbas. 
And before Anna speaks, I'm just going to read out a question from Susie Helm. It's actually two questions for Alex. How central is the stock market to imperialism? And can the efforts of some Latin American countries influenced by Chavez to organize their own alternative stock market outside US European influence pose a meaningful challenge from above? Hi, I'm Anna Livingston from East London. Uh, thanks for a clear presentation, Alex. Mine is really a question. 20, 30 years ago, when Nigel Harris was in the SWP, he led a debate on the question of whether m the states would shrivel and multinationals would become the agents of imperialism, and I don't think he's been proven right. I've, I would agree with the current formulation. However, I wanted to pose the question to Alex as how you saw uh, multinational organization of capitalism, the international nature of capitalism, uh, relating to the competition between imperialist states. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to take up uh, state capitalism, um, which I think state capitalism as a theory disappears the class character of a state. Uh, so in, in terms of the Soviet Union, it disappears that it was a worker state. And in terms of China, it disappears that it is a worker state. Um, you can scoff all you want, but that is the class character of those states. And yes, they've got, you know, the Soviet Union had a bureaucracy, and China has a bureaucracy. And it should be the role of the international working class to defend China because it is a worker state and to call for, for a political revolution to overthrow the bureaucracies there. So, I mean, you know, that's what state capitalism does. Uh, in regards to Russia, I mean, Russia is not being the aggressor here. You know, uh, they're basically defending their borders, which any other capitalist country would do. But I would like to remind, like Alex and, and you know, the SWP, that Putin is a direct successor of Boris Yeltsin. You know, the guys, these people cheered during the overthrow of the Soviet Union, you know, as a progressive force. That's what Putin is. He's a successor of Boris Yeltsin. Um, in regards to Crimea, I mean, you know, it's rich. I mean, you know, you're saying, oh, there's Russian aggression there. Well, it's the basic right of self-determination. And the right of self-determination is not contingent on the role of the reactionary leaderships, right? This is the democratic right of a people, and that should be defended. That's what Crimea was. Um, and that's all I have to say. All right. After Rob, um, it will be my trunk. Sometimes an argument uh, is proved um, negatively, which is, I think, um, something we've just heard. But I wanted to address one of the effects of her campist approach to imperialism, and that is the distorted approach to the slogan of the First World War amongst revolutionaries, the main enemy is at home. Because if you have that first um, understanding of imperialism that Alex referred to, of the one big imperialist power, what that then uh, leads to is an approach that we've seen recently over Ukraine, for example, where some on the left have argued the main enemy is at home means that you cannot criticize any other imperialist power apart from U.S. imperialism. Now, this is a misunderstanding of how that slogan was used. When Lenin and other revolutionaries arrived at that slogan, they didn't start with that conception of imperialism. They started with a ruthless denunciation of imperialism as a system and every imperialist rival within that system. That is the approach that Lenin takes in his classic pamphlet, Socialism and War. And secondly, it doesn't stop with the slogan. Because if it did, Kautsky would have been right when he said to Lenin, but that would just mean everyone loses. How can everyone lose? But it didn't stop because it then went on to say, we need to turn the imperialist war into a civil war, in a class war, which means the mutual ruin of all the imperialist rivals. So when you look at that principle and apply it, for example, to the Second World War, it's not simply that Trotskyist then said, the main enemy is at home. The form that it took was to say, we want a class war against fascism, which means no compromise in supporting miners in South Wales, no compromise uh, who were on strike during the war, no compromise on colonialism and so forth. And you have a similar 
um, scoffing at the slogan, neither Washington nor Moscow, that was used, um, formulated by Tony Cliff, founder of the SWP during the Cold War. And um, even the claim that it was never um, an anti-imperialist slogan. So I just want to finish with this, which is Cliff's first use of the slogan in The Struggle of the Powers. In their mad rush for profit, for wealth, the two gigantic imperialist powers are threatening the existence of world civilization, threatening humanity with the terrible suffering of atomic war. The interests of the working class of humanity demand that neither of the imperialist world powers be supported, but that both be struggled against. The battle cry of the real, genuine socialist today must be neither Washington nor Moscow, but international socialism. Um, before I ask my question, which I wrote down and completely have forgotten, uh, it, the, I, the, there is one point that I, I want to raise, which is this. If, as Marx followed Hegel in saying that first, uh, important events happen twice, first is tragedy, second is farce, isn't it the case that the situation um, in, in, in Far East, would, if, if it's the fact that the First World War in Europe was an awful, terrible tragedy. Would the would, would this setup in South Asia or Southeast Asia or Asia itself be a farce? I'm always hopeful anyway. The, the question I, I want to ask is, uh, ask Alex is this. Um, if, if, if an is industrial base is required to fund a war machine of a state, and Vietnam in a way is an exception in the sense it's a regional power, but it doesn't have an industrial base, would that affect its war capacity uh, d during this oncoming crisis? Ollie will be followed by Mark Thomas. Um, I'd just like to respond to that um, quote you read out by Tony Cliff. I don't know where he's now. Um, I don't think, I never thought I'd be in this position, but um, I'm from the Spartans League. I'm actually recommending that you reread this book or you, you buy it if you haven't. Um, it's Tony Cliff, State Capitalism in Russia. You know, because in this book, you know, it's clear where state capitalism leads, le leads people, you know. Um, Tony Cliff supported an organisation called the Ukrainian Insurgent Army um, um, against the, the, the Red Army. Um, uh, during the Second World War. The Ukrainian insurgent army and the, the Vlasov movement, which Tony Cliff also supported, um, they, they, they carried out pogroms against Jews, they, they fought the Red Army, they, they killed Poles, you know, they were Nazi collaborators. Um, and Cliff, uh, quote, um, said um, that the, these, these people strive consciously or semi-consciously, even unconsciously, for socialist um, democracy uh, against Stalinism. You know, this is Cliff, you should, it's, it's all in here, you know. And this is where state capitalism leads, you know. It's, there's no third camp. It's, it's clearly in the camp of the imperialists. Um, and just as Cliff um, whitewashed the fascists in Ukraine then, um, Alex Kalinikos washes the, um, the, the, the fascist danger now, you know. Back in March, Alex Kalinikos said, there is no evidence of any threat to Russian speakers in, in, um, in, in Crimea or, or, or Ukraine. How, how stupid was that then? I mean, look at it now, you know. People have been massacred by the, um, the Kiev government. Um, you know, that have, that have neo-Nazis and fascists as ministers that, whose, um, whose elite forces are the right sector. You know, they are massacring Russian speakers and ethnic Russians um, in, in the Donbass region today. Um, and we're the, uh, of the Spartacist League for the, the right of self-rule in the Donbass. Um, it's, it's a, as my comrade said before, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a democratic right. You know, um, and uh, all nations have an equal right to self-determination, and uh, that, we're with Lenin on that. There's, the world isn't split between oppressor and oppressed peoples. Only oppressed peoples have a right to e exist. That's a Stalinist deviation. Mark will be followed by John Newsinger. Okay. Um, look, um, one of the, the great achievements of the British left, actually, uh, in recent years was the magnificent anti-war movement that we built in the early, in the early 2000s. Uh, and that, the question of imperialism and the, the need for an anti-war movement with an anti-imperialist core remains, as we can see with the attacks on Israel. But th at the risk of repetition, uh, I think we need to underline what's being said here, which is that the anti-imperialist movement faces a test, faces a sharp test. There needs to be a, a retooling of the anti-imperialist movement uh, if it's to carry on meeting the tasks and challenges it faced, because 
there is a revival of inter-imperialist tension. Actually, it never went away. There's a sharpening of inter-imperialist com competition and tension, and that we need to get it right. Um, the collapse of the Soviet Union saw the Russian state retreat. It was in utter disarray. It began to reorganise and reassert itself. The annexation of Crimea is its first expansion eastwards since 1989. Uh, we crucially see the rise of, of China and the tensions in the South uh, China Sea. And underlying this is the relative decline, I use the word relative decline, of the United States. Now, in this situation, of course it's not true that all imperialist powers are absolutely equal, but we have to have no illusions in any of them. And one manifestation that this takes is that people think that the US is all-powerful, that all events are to be explained. If there's a rebellion against the Assad regime, it must be reducible to US power, that what happened in the Maidan in Ukraine is simply reducible to US manipulation. There is a revival of inter-imperialist competition, and in that situation, the classical Marxist analysis uh, and the kind of politics put forward by Lenin. I mean, at one point, Lenin says, uh, faced with a war between different slave owners, and one slave owner has 200 slaves and another has 100, they're not all equal. You don't say, who is the lesser evil here? You say, down with all the slave owners. And they use the clashes between them to undermine the power of all of them. And that politics has to be at the heart of the anti-imperialist movement today if it's to remain the kind of force that we built in the early 2000s. And there is a test and there is a danger that will collapse into politics that takes sides between imperialist powers. And we have to reject that thoroughly. John will be followed by Jimmy Ross, who will be our last speaker. And apologies to anyone who didn't get called. Yeah, I think a case can be made that we've already seen the first shooting war, if you like, to curb uh, Chinese influence. Um, I would argue that um, the intervention against Libya um, in many ways was motivated by uh, Libya's alignment with China in Africa. Uh, what's interesting is you actually... I mean, it's worth making the point as well that the US State Department today doesn't actually consider China as a communist threat. It considers China as an authoritarian capitalist threat. Threat. This is the way U.S. State Department officials discuss China today. Uh, sections of the left could well catch up with this. Um, <laughs> what you had, of course, people remember, is Gaddafi had actually made all sorts of overtures to Berlusconi. Um, you know, he'd embraced Berlusconi. Our own former beloved leader, Tony Blair, uh, had been embraced uh, by Gaddafi. Uh, British troops, were, uh, British advisers were training uh, Gaddafi's army. Uh, but the fact of the matter was that while he was making gestures towards various European states, Gaddafi was also arguing uh, very much for African states to align themselves with China uh, as a way of um, combating, contesting, limiting American influence. Uh, and I would argue this was what motivated the intervention against Gaddafi. Uh, this was the reason why Gaddafi was overthrown. Um, nothing to do with his anti-imperialism. Gaddafi um, was looking towards China as a way of combating American influence. What I think is interesting, though, is that you have a situation where the Americans could bring Gaddafi down, uh, but nevertheless, you know, we have a weakness of American imperialism that uh, they can't replace Gaddafi with a chosen candidates, they can't put a regime in place. And what I think is an interesting development is we actually have a situation where um, American imperialism in particular would rather see a failed state than a state that is allied um, or looking towards China. And I think this is a phenomenon that we're likely to see more, that uh, the uh, Americans, because of their own weakening um, economic and military position would actually rather see a state collapse. And, of course, it cost them in Libya because, you know, the people uh, who they had helped to power uh, promptly shot the American ambassador. Um, thank you. Someone asked a question earlier on about uh, UK imperialism and uh, it, it, its role. And I think that uh, if you look at the decline of um, uh, the UK since the First World War, in debt to America becomes the junior partner and the decline continued um, apace after the Second World War. But when you 
see that so-called special relationship that is supposed to exist, that junior partner, Britain, is very, very helpful. That UK-US partnership, particularly look at the Blair-Bush alliance uh, over, the, over the Gulf War. And that special relationship uh, can, can be undermined in a very particular way. I'm looking just now at the referendum on Scottish uh, in independence. And if you think of two particular arguments for a yes vote there... One is the removal of Trident um, from Scotland, and there's nowhere else for it to go, basically. There isn't another deep water terminal that, 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 can, be, that, that can be put in. But secondly, as well, the uh, rest of the UK without Scotland would then be in a very weak position to be able to retain its seat on the UN Security Council. And that US-UK special relationship would run into real, real, real difficulties. So... There's a petition doing the rounds just now for people in England and Wales to support uh, a yes vote in Scotland. If you're looking for arguments, those two, I think, for people who are anti-imperialist, are two real killer arguments off the UN Security Council and trying out of Scotland and Britain. OK, uh, thanks to Jimmy for answering the question about... Um, about British imperialism. Anna asked um, uh, about how the, this geopolitical competition that I've been describing fits in with the multinational character of, of capi capitalism. Of course, there's a tension between the two, but that's not new. Dave from Germany talked about the case of um, IBM and Ford, and indeed it's also true of General Motors, the, their role during the Second World War. Um, in the interwar period, the U.S. invested massively in, in Germany. Um, it, uh, Opel, the German subsidiary of General Motors, was taken over at the end of the 1920s. The U.S. lent very heavily to Germany. That's an example of global in international integration. Didn't stop the U.S. Air Force bombing uh, Germany to the, to the ground during, during the Sec Second World War. This is... This is it. The the Bukharin brought out how the constitutive antagonism that defines imperialism is that between the internationalisation of capital economically and the national antagonisms between between capitalist states. Similarly, and this in a, maybe this will help with Susie's question about the role of the stock market. If we look at the start of the the the, the f first world war, there was a huge financial crisis centred on the the city of London, the worst crash till the one that took place a few, uh, a few, a few years ago. And this was because um, global trade and investment was financed through a system of bills of exchange, which were kind of IOUs between different, different companies. They were the kind of the, the 19th century equivalent of credit derivatives and so on. And all of this was financed by, by British firms, by British, British banks. The start of the First World War, there's this tremendous panic because everyone says if there's going to be war between Germany and France and Britain, then the Germans and the French are going to stop repaying their debts to the, um, to the British banks, which indeed wa was what happened. And this panic nearly called the, caused the entire collapse of the city, and it represented the shriveling for a long time of what had been a very globalised financial system. So the fact that the system is globally integrated economically doesn't prevent the mo uh, very destructive inter-imperialist wars. Susie asked about um, the v Venezuela's, under Chavez's attempt to create a kind of alternative economic network to those dominated by... Um, by the, the US. Um, Venezuela today is in such a severe uh, internal economic and political crisis that it can't act as a focus of anything, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. Read Mike Gonzalez's article in the latest inter International Socialism. What? There is a realignment in Latin America, but it's not internal to Latin America, it's to, towards China. Um, because of Latin America's role now as a supplier of energy and raw materials to the to the Chinese e economy. And there, there are quite interesting developments. I mean, there's a lot of bullshit about the BRICS, but the BRICS are now a formal international organization of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and S South Africa. They're in the process of setting up their own investment bank. Now, 
that, that potentially, because the Chinese banks have so much money, that could be an important international institution. But that, that then takes us precisely to one of the main, main points of this meeting. That won't represent a break with imperialism. That will represent a realignment of international financial relationships around the new rising imperialist power. Um, I agree generally what, with what Charlie Hall said, and I very much respect his knowledge and understanding of what ha- happens in China. And I think he's right that the Americans have been quite clever on playing on the fears of the states neighbouring China, the fear, their fears of a more assertive China. I don't th- completely agree that China is always the aggressor in this, in this situation. For example, the conflict with Japan in the East China Sea over these islands, which are either called the Daiyu Islands or the Senkaku Islands, depending on which size you are in the dispute. Um, it becomes very difficult if you have Chinese students and you're teaching, you know, <laughs> teaching them about inter-imperialist rivalries, what you call these islands, um, um, as I find myself do- doing. Um, it's actually the, 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 the present period of tension around it was essentially a Japanese initiative the, through efforts by Japanese nationalists increasingly backed up by Tokyo to uh, get greater contro- assert greater control over those, those islands. And if, if you talk to people from East Asia, yeah, they worry about China, but they have very, very, very strong memories of Japanese imperialism that are still a very powerful factor in the region. So if we look at East Asia... Sure, there's the U.S. versus China, but there's a, a, a you know a multipolar uh, conflict involving other other powers: Japan, South Korea. South Korea is in the process of doubling its military spending, and 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 so on. Uh, finally, to the international Satanist tendency, as Tariq Ali affectionately called them. Um, the um, where, where 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 do I start? Cliff on the Ukraine. Um, what happened in 1939 was that um, Poland was partitioned b- b- between Stalin and Hitler, and um, uh, uh, Russia got the eastern part of, of Poland. The Soviet Union got the eastern part of Poland, which included quite a lot of what um, what is now included in the Ukraine. Um, that led to a lot of resistance to the new imposition of r- Russian power, which... Um, did indeed lead to some Ukrainian nationalists allying with the Germans when they invaded invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. But that resistance continued on quite a broad basis in the western parts of Ukraine after the defeat of Germany in the second half of the 1940s right through to the early 1950s. And it's true that some of those forces had alignments with, uh, with, uh, had allied with the Germans, others were backed by the Americans. But what what Cliff, and not just Cliff, other Trotskyists, showed that there was quite a wide spectrum of forces, including some <coughs> that had leftist politics, because there had been quite strong left-wing parties in the Western Ukraine before the, before the Second World War. So please, get your history right. Um, when, the, when the guy talks about the right to self, uh, Russia asserting its right to self-determination, what exactly, over what is Russia, uh, does Russia have a right to self-determination over? Over Crimea, for example? Crimea, which Russian military power, which Catherine the Great seized from the Ottoman Empire in the late 18th century. Crimea, where at the end of the Second World War, Stalin expels the predominantly Muslim Turkic population and and subsequently um, transformed the ethnic character of the population through Russian, Russian settlers. So really what this means, this is a new development of Marxism, the right to self-determination means defending the right of imperial powers to regain control of their colonies. I think that would, you know, the Irish comrades here, I think they would find that a very interesting development of, of Marxism. We should defend the right of Britain to reconquer Southern Ireland. I mean, <laughs> what next? Um, finally, I mean, I think that although what the comrades have said is laughable, we shouldn't underestimate just how terrible the situation is potentially in in Ukraine. What we have is the clash of two rival nationalists, each of which have their fascist wings, each of which have their fascist wings, each of which are backed by imperialist powers, each of which are armed, which which are producing a territorial struggle that could at worst 
produce the kind of things that we saw in the Balkans in the, in the, in the 1990s. And what serious revolutionaries would try to do would be to under, understand the dynamic of that, ki- that conflict rather than siding with one or other of the, the nationalisms. But the whole, what's hap- developed in Ukraine underlines the importance of having a deep-seated and profound understanding of imperialism and its capacity to produce these kind kind of horrors and also the necessity of getting rid of that system.